Hi everyone, my name is Emily and I am a certificate student and I am presenting you guys the lecture 10-2 which is the abdominal cavity development and I just wanted to explain a little bit as to why I chose this lecture and it might help you guys have more of an interest in it and see how it can be beneficial to understanding all the anatomy in the body. So personally I like embryology, I think it has it's good for you to understand the process and it helped me in the class because although it didn't seem like the most important thing for us to know, especially alongside dissection because we weren't necessarily seeing these structures because they had gone on to be something else, it just helped for me to better understand why something was here and why it was innervated by this or why it had innervations from multiple different sources. Um, so it can be kind of hard to picture what's going on, especially because it's not what the actual adult structure looks like. So I added a video on this first slide that just looks black, but you guys can play it in your PowerPoint. Um, and it just helps to give you a better idea of the whole process. It's just a video with no words. Um, you can honestly probably watch the first half, but the whole video is good. And it just shows a time lapse of the body folding onto itself in the embryological form in the abdominal cavity. So it kind of just makes more sense when you see it as a video than just as a static picture. So maybe if you watch it before you listen to this and then if you watch it after, it might help for everything to come together. And there's a lot of videos online if this one doesn't help you that can explain certain things because it can be hard to pick up on. So I believe you guys have seen this slide before, just about during the fourth week in the body cavity mesoderm. So the mesoderm is one of the three layers of gastrulation that um, gives rise to our body structure. So we have our endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm. So mesoderm primarily has to do with your body, your body's musculature and the linings like that. So... Um, so yeah, so we have our parietal mesoderm, and it's all shown in the red, so red on these pictures. Um, so that goes on to be our parietal mesentery, and it's forming our body cavity wall. Then we have our visceral mesoderm, which lines the organs of our body cavities, and you can see it sort of lining the yolk sac. And then our dorsal mesentery is what bridges these two layers. And on the picture C, you can see the dorsal mesentery um, bridging the visceral and the parietal mesentery together. Um, so we're going to talk more about our dorsal mesentery and ventral mesentery. So the dorsal mesentery actually goes on to be our greater omentum. And the next slide actually shows a better picture of that. Um, so our greater omentum, when you get to dissect your cadavers, you'll definitely see this structure. It's this fatty looking tissue area um, that doesn't look like it would have the biggest purpose in the body, but it really does. It is a huge area for blood vessels and lymphatics. Um, and just, it does provide a, in a way like a physical barrier because once you open the body cavity, you see this fatty layer that Dr. Sani likes to call an apron that sort of just protects the organs underlying it. Um, but also, from a physiological standpoint, it has a lot of immune cells in it because if you think about it, when you ingest food from the outside environment, it's going directly into your stomach and your intestines. And it just makes sense that you would have a lot of immune cells there because that can be a huge area where bacteria or infections can come. So you want to have a primary line of defense to combat against that. Um, and then our ventral mesentery um, goes on to be the lesser omentum. So just kind of intuitively how the greater omentum is bigger. It's this big fatty layer. The um, lesser omentum is in between the lesser curvature of the stomach and attaches to the liver and it goes on to become the falciform lip, um, ligament of the liver which is that ligament right there in between the two lobes of the liver. So 
It definitely is smaller, but it's just providing an attachment to from the stomach to the liver. So in the fifth week, we are having body ca our body cavity closure. So our septum transversum, that is um, a part of mesoderm, and it's not completely separating the primordial thoracic and abdominal cavities. It's kind of just like a placeholder waiting for the other structures to form. And so you can see in that picture B that the septum transversum is in orange, and then you have the little liver cords, the beginning of the liver cords developing. Um, and then similarly, I believe, I mean, you can't see the septum transversum in this picture, but um, now we start to have the structures of our thoracic cavity start to form. So you can see our heart there, and then our lung buds are going to start to grow, um, which are expanding into our pleuropericardial canals. Um, and the next slide shows a bit more about that. So yeah, our fifth week, it's growing pretty rapidly, and you can kind of see a form of the embryo that looks more like an adult thoracic cavity. So our lung buds are growing, um, which is expanding the pleuropericardial pericardial membranes. Um, our cavity is now divided into a pericardial cavity and two pleural lung cavities. And then um, the pleuropericardial membrane is what's actually forming the fibrous pericardium that is around the heart. And if you notice, the phrenic nerve is right to the right, right here of the heart. Um, and when you dissect and see it in an actual adult form, you'll see the phrenic nerve attached within the fibrous pericardium and going across the heart, which is just kind of a cool way in which, like, it's just a cool structure to see. Um, but it does start from week five being there. Um, so on the next slide, we start to talk about heart development. So... Our heart, which is derived from mesoderm again, and you can see up here that now we have a tube that is our myocardium. So we have a heart tube before it comes into the structure with the four chambers that we know. So it kind of looks like this weird little wormy structure that has these little segmented areas. So we have an aortic pole, which will eventually give rise to our aorta, and then a venous pole, which will give rise to the veins of the pulmonary veins of the heart. Um, so the heart tube will eventually have a sprout an aortic arch vessel to create the arch of aorta, um, but then our venous poles still remain paired. So um, on this next slide, I added in a picture from the board review series on embryology that just kind of details better which each segment of the heart tube means before it goes on to the process of dextral looping where it becomes the heart form that we see today. Um, so up here in orange is our aortic pole and embryolog embryologically it's called our truncus arteriosus so it's going to be going off into the aorta and the pulmonary trunk um, our bulbous cordis is this green and it creates both the smooth parts of the left and right ventricle. Our primitive ventricle creates or goes on to be the trabeculated parts of both the right and left ventricle. Um, our primitive atrium is the tra trabeculated parts of the right and left atrium. And then our sinus venosus creates, goes on to be a smooth part of the right atrium. And then also our coronary sinus and oblique vein of of the left atrium. Um, so this is at around 22 days, just showing the blood flow. Um, and then at 26 days is when we begin dextral looping, which is the process where the, the heart tube folds onto itself in order to create the structure of the heart and have just the spatial areas of the four chambers correct. And then at 30 to 35 days is when the dextral looping is complete. So this slide shows it a little better when they start to loop around each other. Um, 
So yeah, like I said, this process is called dextral looping and it'll bring the four chambers of the adult heart into the correct spatial relationship with one another. Um, so we also concurrently have the atrial ventricular partitioning because in the tube form of it, it was showing just the blood flow within it. But now that we have it folded onto itself, it makes sense that we need to have partitioning to make sure that the blood flow is correct. So at week four, we have our atrioventricular canal, which is shown in as like the yellow highlight in between our two endocardial cushionings. So the atrioventricular canal is between our primitive atrium and the primitive ventricle. So during week four, we develop these swellings, which are called our endocardial cushions, um, and they develop on the walls of the primitive heart right at the level of the atrioventricular canal, and then they close up there. Um, and on the next side, more partitioning. So the reason why we have this partitioning is because there would only be one outflow path from the fused ventricles if we didn't um, partition. And obviously that would pose just errors in the process because the whole concept of the heart is that it's bringing blood from different chambers that are oxygenated or deoxygenated. So if we didn't have partitioning, it would just be mixing it all up. So the aortic pulmonary septum is going to create our two outflow paths for the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. And when this aortic pulmonary septum develops, it's time to coincide with the completion of the interventricular septum um, so that when you have two separate ventricles formed, there will be an outflow path for each. So both the ventricle, interventricular septums and the partitioning for the aortic pulmonary septum happens at the same time. So you have two separate ventricles and two separate outflow paths for both the pulmonary chunk, which brings the deoxygenated blood to the lungs from the right ventricle, and the aorta, which brings the oxygenated blood from the left ventricle throughout the entire body. So we still are going throughout through body closure at the end of the fifth week, seventh week, <clears throat> and fourth month. So our lung buds, which we talked about a couple slides back, are still growing pretty rapidly, um, which while they're growing, that's expand, expanding the pleuroperitoneal membranes. Um, and they are at, those pleuroperitoneal membranes are actually going to fuse with the septum transversum um, during the seventh week. And they fuse at the root of the lung and the heart tube on the heart tube during that seventh week. Um, we also see, which you can see in the red on picture C, our muscular mesoderm, which is growing in to form the body wall. So it's going to go on to form our body wall muscles, which obviously have an important part in respiration and just keeping everything together. Um, and so these structures are actually going to become the thoracic diaphragm. So on the next slide, we have a bit more. We have it, a bit more about what structures become the thoracic diaphragm. So our septum transversum, which we talked about before, that's going to become our central tendon. I actually like the next slide with the picture of it. So our tra septum transversum becomes the central tendon, which is just on the top part of the diaphragm, you can see. And then our pleuroperitone pleuroperitoneal folds are becoming the dorsal aspect of the non-muscular part of the diaphragm. Then we have our body wall myoblast, which we talked about on the previous slide, and they're becoming the muscular portion of the diaphragm. A myoblast is just a beginning cell of what's going to go on to be a muscle. Um, and then our dorsal mesentery, which we talked about way in the beginning of this, um, the dorsal mesentery around the esophagus is going to become our crura of the diaphragm. So we have the right crust to the right and the left crust to the left. Um, and they, since it, it was dorsal mesentery around the esophagus, you can sort of see the esophageal hiatus with these two, with this um, superior hole and then the aortic hiatus. Um, 
And so our diaphragm in its adult form has a lot of different vasculature and innervation. So seeing that it is formed from these four aspects, it makes sense that there isn't just one primary innervation to it. So that just sort of explains why, like you might think it would make more sense to just have one nerve, one artery, one vein, um, innervate, irrigate, and drain it. But since it was developed from the fifth week from multiple different parts of our embryological self, it makes sense that we have different vasculature and stuff going to it. So as with anything, we can have disorders of the diaphragm formation, which are clinically relevant, especially to you DPTs. So um, our congenital diaphragmatic hernia, this congenital happens like from birth, from in utero. So this actually happens when our um, when we have a failure of the pleuroperitoneal membrane to move out laterally. So our septum transversum, it stops at the gut tube and then it leaves for two open passageways on the left and right sides, which we talked about are our pericardial canals. Um, or plero, sorry, I say this wrong. Pericardioperitoneal canals. Um, so closure of these canals, we need to have growth of our dorsolateral body wall and the pleuroperitoneal membranes. So if we don't have closure of that, we can develop a congenital diaphragmatic hernia and then our peritoneal contents are going to be in our pleural cavity, which obviously is not good. Um, we can also have a parasternal hernia, which is when our myoblasts have failure to close between the sternal and costal diaphragm. And then a hiatal hernia, which you probably have heard about before, and that's just when the stomach is pulled up past the diaphragm into the mediastinum so it herniates or bulges through the diaphragm to go into the mediastinum which is a cavity that your stomach should not be in um, and then this can affect your gastric autonomics um, by the vagus nerve so that is the end of this powerpoint um, like i said i probably didn't explain everything perfectly but i think embryology just can kind of help you guys have a better perspective, especially when you're dissecting. And obviously you're not gonna see a lot of these structures as we talked about them as they were at week five or like just in utero in the embryo, but they do eventually go on to become the big structures that you see in your body. So I think it is definitely very important. Um, and if you guys have any questions about it, you can always ask me and I hope this was helpful and good luck to all you guys.